To that end, we will look at Luke chapter 12. So turn there if you would, and we get to hear the word of God today, which I'm looking forward to. So uh, I grew up in a family where uh, there are there were people that just they thought it was their gift, their calling to be worriers. Did anyone grow up in an environment where there were just worriers, right? People ask me, Scott, did you play football? I go, nope. Mom didn't let me. Why? What if you break a bone? I grew up, I didn't ride dirt bikes. Why? Well, what if you get into an accident? I didn't grow up in an environment that fostered liberty in exploring lots of cool, fun, boy, guy type stuff. Why? Because mom was always there going, well, what if? What if this happens? What if that happens? And you know where she got it from? She got it from her mom, my grandma. And even though my mom died at a young age, 39 years of age, my grandma lived to be 92 years old. And for 92 years, she lived under this, this bully called, called worry. To the day she died, I remember talking to my grandma on the phone being like, Grandma, like when I got called to ministry, which just happened before my mom passed away, my grandma said this, why would you do that? When I took a trip overseas to take the gospel to, to Africa, what, why would you do that? What if the plane crashes? What if you get killed? What if there's terrorism? And my grandma lived under this cloud of worry all her life. Does anyone, anyone have like someone like that in their lives? But let's not point the finger and act as if we don't deal with worry in our own hearts. Right? We all deal with the worry, the, the what ifs. And, and we have this sense of, of worry hanging over us, and it debilitates us. It hinders us. It stops us. And oftentimes we worry about things that probably are not even true. There are these, there are these things that we imagine. There are these hypothetical situations that I think when we look back, we go, why was I so worried about that? Anyone ever been there before? Worry is, is one of those things that, that gives birth to fear. And then ultimately, you know what that fear does? It perpetuates this attitude of selfishness in our lives. Because if I can't look out for myself, I, ha I have nothing to give to you. Time, treasure, talent, anything. And so you can see like these three evil foes that work together. Worry, fear, selfishness. And God knows about these foes. He knows about these enemies, and this is why he speaks to this subject. And Jesus gets to unpack this to us, uh, for us, because he knows how toxic they are in our lives. The, there's, there's really two words that can be used kind of um, um, uh, together, and it's anxiety and worry. Can you write those words down, anxiety and worry? They, they, they mean the same thing at their core, but they kind of have two different manifestations. Anxious is to be distracted, to be torn apart, literally to be strangled. That's, that's anxiety, and people feel anxiety. We, we fret about things ultimately that are not our responsibility. How many of you are, are anxious about things you're really not even involved in? How many of us deal with worry, which means to be tossed about, to be doubtful, to be held in suspense? We we worry about things we can't change or control. So do you understand the difference? Anxiety are things that are not even our responsibility. And worry are things that we can't change or control. And that's tough for control freaks. Anyone a control freak here? I am to a degree. I am to a degree. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. That's Corey Ten Boom. Let me say it again. It's one of the best quotes. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. And of course, she's alluding to Matthew chapter 6, where it says, don't worry about tomorrow. You don't even know what tomorrow's gonna, what's going to happen. Be focused on today. But we try to borrow on tomorrow's strength and grace and mercy. And God says, no borrowing allowed. I've given you just enough for today. And so what we have to realize is that, once again, God invites us to consider, and I'm going to call them the inverted values of his kingdom. 
Write down that phrase, inverted values. Because what you're going to hear today, the world is not going to teach you. So God comes along, and here's what God says about inverted values. If you want to save your life, you must lose it. That's inverted. If you want to have everything, possess nothing. And these are countercultural ideas that come from the mouth of Jesus himself. And he's speaking to his disciples about how we are to consider our lives when it comes to inverted values. We pay too much attention, not only to the world, but we, we buy into a lot of the lies. And hence, we're not like anyone different, right? Anyone different from us. We, we worry, we have fear, we're selfish, and so it doesn't make us any different than someone who doesn't have God. So what are we to consider this morning? Because as you probably heard me say, right beliefs will lead to right thinking, which will lead to right conduct. And I want you to have right beliefs this morning. And I want those beliefs to feed good right thinking. Because when the beliefs match the thinking, you're going to have good practices. You're going to have right behaviors. And so without wasting any more time, eight things worry leads to that I want to counter and I want to speak to inverted values this morning. So eight things. We're not going to be here all day, I promise. Take out your notes, take out your pen, take out your pencil, whatever you want to use. We're kind of old school like that. So a short pencil is better than a long memory. That's, that's one of my phrases. So Luke 12, check this out. Starting at verse 22. We're going to read the section in its entirety. Go back. I'm going to identify eight things here. He says to his disciples, so we talked last week about greed, the, the rich man who built bigger and bigger barns, and then ultimately he had, he had a lot of possessions, but he neglected the one thing that mattered eternally, and that was his soul. And so then the disciples are probably curious, like, well, that's a rich man, and we're not really rich. What about our needs? So now Jesus speaks to the disciples. This is, this is to those of us who, who claim Jesus is Lord and Savior. So these are words to us. Verse 22. He says to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you will eat or your body as to what you shall put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why are you anxious about other matters? If then you cannot even um, um, consider the lilies, verse 27, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of those. But if God so arrays the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow and thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you shall eat and what you shall drink, and do not keep worrying, for these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. So seek for his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Be not afraid, little flock. For your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make for yourselves purses which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. May God bless the reading of his word and may he write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. Eight things real quick. The first is this. Worrying leads to confusion. Notice verse 22. Do not be anxious for your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, right? What you're going to put on. Life is more than food in the body than clothing. See, what worry does is it, it, it doesn't allow us to prioritize things in a proper way. See, we live in a, in, a, in a context in which people put in a supreme value upon what they wear, on what they drive the kind of job they do, the, the food they eat, and people live their lives as if those are the most important things. And Jesus is saying, I don't want to minimize those things, but I want you to know that there's more important things than lunch today. And there's more important things than the clothes you're going to put on. 
today. See, we tend to prioritize the wrong things. We uh, are concerned about how God is going to serve us. And Jesus is really addressing that the concern ought to be how you are going to serve God. Don't worry about the food. Don't worry about your clothing. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Those are good things, but they often distract us. How many of you, maybe this is my own little world, I get done with breakfast and I'm already thinking about lunch. Anyone there with me feel that, feel that, that pressure? Like, man, that was good. What am I going to have for lunch? Right? And, and we're talking about those things, and, and there's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with planning Christmas dinner, Christmas lunch, Christmas breakfast. Oh, doesn't that sound good right now? Like, I'm already in charge of Belgian waffles, just so you guys know. But I'm not going to be concerned about that. And we can plan about these things, food and clothing. But here's the, there's nothing wrong with planning, but there's something wrong with being preoccupied with these things. That's the word. If my mindset is constantly dwelling on these things, what Jesus is saying is this. Get your mind off those things which are good, but they're not ultimate things. Because the food is not your life. The clothing is not your life. Look back at verse 15. We looked at this last week, Luke 12, 15. He tells this parable, right, about this man because he wants people to know that for not even when one has an abundance of things does your life consist of those possessions. We try to find identity through our clothes. Like, I'm the guy that wears the patterned shirts, right? And my wife was in my closet last night. Our, I saw our closet. I'm sorry. Our closet. And she goes, honey, you have too many of these shirts. And I go, that's not, that's not a thing. So next topic, what are we going to talk about? And I said, and I need to start dividing my shirts into categories because I have animal shirts, whole section. And then I've got nature shirts with planets and trees and stuff like I'm not, I'm not obsessed about these things, or maybe I am. I don't know. What is that? Food, Food and shirts. That's my, that's my jam. I'm sorry. Food shirts, yeah. And then there's food category. I've got sushi and uh, other things like that. But, but you know what? But that's not me. As much as people may go like, is Scott that shirt guy? He's always wearing those pattern shirts. I'm more than my shirts. I'm more than the food I eat. I'm more than the car I drive. Life is more than that which sustains it. You don't describe an airplane, right, that requires fuel to run. We don't sit there and go, you know, boy, that fuel is pretty amazing, huh, when it comes to that airplane. We don't even think about it. Why? Because that's not what defines or identifies the plane. You need to understand that your life is greater than the sum of all the parts that comprise you. Jesus wants us to understand. Luke chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says these words, which you know. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. As much, who loves bread? I've already confessed how much I love bread. But my life is more than the bread I eat. You need to understand you are more valuable than the labels and the identification that the world puts upon you. You're one created in the image of God. This is why J Jesus says, regarding bread, J John chapter 6, verse 32, he says these words, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread. Meaning, don't focus on physical bread, which Jesus isn't saying is awful, but there's a greater food that should sustain you. Why? Because he is that bread. The bread of God, which he has come down from heaven, right, gives life to the world, right? It is that bread that gives life. How many of us have, have been confused by giving our, our lives over to that which we thought would give us life? And Jesus says, I'm the one who gives life. Don't confuse earthly, material, tactile, tangible things. Look into those things that's going to bring you. That's a wrong prioritization. Look to me who's going to satisfy you through and through. And all God's people said, it is foolish to think about what am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to have for lunch? Right? If I'm preoccupied by it, it's foolish. 
It's foolish to think about, what am I going to wear tomorrow? What am I going to wear tomorrow? What am I going to wear tomorrow? It's foolish, Jesus says. Why? Because there are more important things to tend to. Second point, worrying leads to blindness. Look at verse 24, 27. Jesus in this section points us to three things in nature. Because what worrying does is it blinds us to the world that God has created. Consider the ravens, consider the lilies, consider the grass. Right? Jesus says what worrying does is it, it forces you to focus inward on what you don't have. It focuses on your heart and, and feeds discontentment. And what you're missing out on is a world that God has designed that not only does he sustain, but he provides for. I don't know about you, but during the COVID times, that's how we're going to look back in history on these moments. Oh, those COVID times. You know, it's been one of the most freeing things so that my heart, your hearts, don't become captive to worry and fear. It's just getting outside. Getting outside. I take my, my kids are like fighting. And like, and it's like, all right, we're going on a hike. And they're like, no, like as if the hike's the worst thing. And but once we're outside, all the crying stops, all the fighting stops. Why? Because it's like you're immersed into a world where we are reminded knowingly, unknowingly that there's a God who says, I've clothed the mountains and I've clothed the cacti, and I've clothed the birds, and I've clothed the clouds, and everything is my creation. We don't walk out into the world and go, this place is ugly. We walk out into the world and go, this place is awesome. But worry doesn't allow us to see the beauty of creation. This is why Christ continues to point back to creation. We must stop and look around to birds that are, you know, the ravens were considered unclean. Even the unclean animals God cares for. The grass that, I just mowed the grass the other day. It's short-lived. It grows, I cut it, I dump it, it's done. But God still says to us, consider who I am. And are you of not more value than the birds? And are you of not more value than the lilies? Are you of not more value than the grass? See, security comes from a relationship with God, not by the stuff we own. Security comes not by what we can buy and what we can possess, but who owns us. It's not what God gives to us that's key. It's who God is to us that's key. Stop and consider that. I love this idea. We, as believers in Christ, have a, there's a double paternity when it comes to God. Double paternity. He is not only father creator, he is also father redeemer. Think about that. Not only have you been created in his image, you have been saved by his grace. Oh my goodness. And, and, and what are we worried about? You have a father who has doubly blessed you. He's not only brought you here. He has saved you here. And I think that is an incredible, incredible gift of grace from his hand. Point number three. Worry leads to laziness. Look at verse 24. Consider the ravens. And, and Jesus has talked about birds before. Remember the sparrows? I'm wondering where Jesus... Why didn't he mention vultures or condors or parrots? <laughs> but he wants you to know something, right? Like, consider the birds. I have never seen birds sit down at a table, draw out a blueprint, and think about their week ahead. Okay, so honey, this is what you're going to do tomorrow, and this is where I'm going to go. And, and you know the birds do? They just fly around and kind of like, okay, pick this up, build this nest, provide this food, you know. I've never seen a bird fly through the sky and drop dead from cardiac arrest. Why? Because the birds live today. Somehow God has wired them to just do what they need to do 
and be okay with that. See, Jesus is speaking to the disciples where they're thinking, Jesus, um, I still have to eat, right? How are we going to plan and prepare for these things? We're not the rich man who stored up the storehouses with all the treasure and possessions. What about us? And here's what Jesus says. Work, but don't work where it's going to bring about this planning that's going to cause stress in your life, this preoccupation. See, worry, it, it, it immobilizes us. Worry debilitates us, and all of a sudden, we're so busy fretting that we have no energy now to be productive. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You've got today. Live today to the fullest. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. But you know what? Live today. Live today. Whatever God has put upon your heart, whatever passions he's, he's ignited within you, live for today and go to sleep tonight. And if you wake up tomorrow, just live for tomorrow. And then if you get, you get up on Tuesday, which I hope we all do, <laughs> live to the fullest on Tuesday. Jonathan Edwards one of the greatest minds America ever produced, president of Yale University at like 20, 21. Amazing, he was the catalytic pastor during the Great Awakening. He made this list of resolutions. Like, I resolve to do these things, like convictions, number one conviction. Edwards talked about, live today as if it was my last. Number one. Can I encourage you to live with that resolution in your own heart, too? <laughs> There's nothing wrong about thinking about tomorrow, maybe even praying about tomorrow, but don't be preoccupied with tomorrow. You've got right now. I've, I've been with too many people at their deathbed where they are filled with regrets of things they didn't do and relationships they didn't foster. And I'm sitting there going, why would you want to live that way? Live today for the glory of God and, and the goodness of one another. And you know, tomorrow, if you wake up, repeat. Kind of like Groundhog Day for the glory of God. Repeat. The birds are an example. Man, they just are chirping, they're singing, they, they, and somehow they go to bed and they wake up tomorrow and they're still chirping. And they, why? Because they're focused on today. Learn from. Number four, worry leads to fruitlessness. Look at verse 25. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single minute, single hour, single day to your life? Right? This, it, it accom worry accomplishes nothing. No one can say to me and go, I've been on this trend of worrying lately, and let me tell you the good that's come out of it. No one has ever had this conversation. <laughs> right? I don't see Oprah touting this new book, this new best, 10 steps to maximizing your worry, right? Like, yeah! can't wait to get my hands on that, right? Worry changes nothing. Think about it. Worry is a fruitless activity. It is ineffectual. It gets you nowhere. It does no good. It doesn't reduce problems. It only, here's the, here's the only thing worry does, creates more misery. The only thing worry does. If you live in the realm of worry, it only takes you deeper into the spiral of worry. And when you go deeper into worry, stress goes up. It's kind of like those pulleys with weights on them, right? You pull, worry goes down, deeper and deeper. You're in this worry spiral. Guess what goes up? Stress. And the two work hand in hand. Every time worry pops up, in the moment that, that it does in your heart, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Place that moment, that worry, this concern, and ask God, what do you want me to learn right now with this situation? Because when worry appears, it is not your strength that you're to focus on. It is God's strength. When worry appears, it's not your possessions that are going to get you out of this. It's God's providence. See, Worry is an indication, an indicator in your light that says, this is not about you. This is about God saying something to you right now. I don't know how many people, years ago, there's a story of the worry box. Someone created this worry box and said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little box. I'm going to put it on my counter at home. And when a worry comes up, I'm going to write that worry on a piece of paper. 
Um, and when I put it in the box, I'm saying to myself, I am not going to think about this for a week. Put the worry in the box, come back a week later, open the box, look at it, and every time this person put that worry in that box, they came back and they said, the situation took care of itself. It, it solved its, itself. It wasn't even anything I needed to be concerned about. Maybe we all need to create a worry box. Maybe we need to put into a box those things that are gripping our hearts, strangling our lives, and say, I'm going to trust God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, right now, 100% of the time, the things we worry about are things we should never worry about. It is, it, it's a fruitless activity. Number five, we're cruising pretty fast, huh? <laughs> Don't get too excited, all right? We're going to hang out on a couple of these a little bit longer. Worry leads to uselessness. Meaning, look what Jesus says about the lilies, the grass. I've, I've turned into one of these people I never thought I'd turn into. Like, look at that flower. Like, I was never like that in high school. I probably would have been beat up pretty bad. But there's, some, there's amazing things. There's amazing, my, I think my kids can sit there like, look how yellow those flowers are. Like, Dad, keep driving the road, right? Like, look how purple, look how green, look how. Here's the thing that Jesus wants you to know about, about God. He loves to adorn things. He loves to make things beautiful. He loves to, to come along and, and adorn the lily and adorn the, the magnolia. And, and you know what he does? Not only does he make them beautiful, but he makes them unique. I don't even know. Do you know how many different kinds of, of uh, lilies there are in the world? There's like 150 different kinds. One literally was just discovered the other day in Madagascar, and they called the ugliest lily ever. And it, it's, it's pretty disturbing, but guess what? It's unique in its own way. Someone may find it beautiful. How many different types of, of, of birds and flowers and this and that? See, God has this way of taking things that he has created and said, I'm, I'm going to put beauty upon this. I'm going to create this uniquely. And, you know, Jesus says, look at verse 27. He says, see how they grow. See how they neither toil nor spin. They're not at their sewing machine. They're not crocheting anything. Even Solomon Richest, wisest man ever could have afforded any robe, any tunic, any t toga, any beanie, any shoes. He could never come up with something as beautiful what, as what God has, has made. God dresses the grass better than he does kings. That's what he's saying. But here's what we need to consider, and I think this is the heart of Christ. He has made you uniquely as he wants you to be. And when we aren't satisfied with how God has made us, we become useless. You need to hear this. God has made you to be you, not somebody else. The power of influence is powerful. That we are bombarded with images and advertisements of this is what you should own, this is how you should look, this is how you should dress, this is how you should talk. And you know what? That's, that's not beautiful and unique. You know what that is? That is a world of uniformity that becomes boring. God doesn't want uniformity. He wants unity. And you know what unity is? Diversity in harmony. And you know what? I love being uniquely me. And there's things I say, and I go, I can't believe I just said that. And people are like, yeah, it's a little awkward. But that, that's me. And there's things that you say, and I sit there and go, whoa, I would have never said it like that. But, you know, I appreciate it because that's you. And there's things that we, we enjoy, and we sit there and go, I don't like that. But you like, I, I can celebrate that. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Be comfortable in your own skin. Has, has God not, number one, created you? And with being created, you're designed in his image. You're an image bearer of the king. No other part of creation has that designation. The grass isn't created in the image of God. The ravens aren't created in the image of God. The lilies aren't created in the image, image of God. You are. So number one, appreciate that. But being created in his image, understand too, that God's handiwork goes beyond just, just creating us as men and women, male and female. He has created us 
Jennifer's and Greg's and Scott's and Angie's and Tom's and, and Ron's. And we're, there is even this, this mosaic of uniqueness that exists among us as humans. Stop criticizing people because they're not like you and start celebrating people because they're not like you. And not only that, just it, s- celebrate you because you are you. I, I know too many people who are like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and get this cosmetic thing done. And I'm going to go get this changed. I'm going to go get this changed. I'm sitting going, why? Just stop and just live in your own skin and accept the fact that, because here's what God wants more than anything. He doesn't want you to change your appearance. He wants you to utilize who you are for his glory and his kingdom. We get bogged down by what we don't look like and what we don't have. And you know what that means? We become useless for ultimate kingdom purposes. Because God's not going to say to me, so how come you didn't get that nose job when, when you were really bothered by that? How about the breast augmentation? How come you didn't, that didn't happen to you? God's not concerned about your exterior. He's concerned about your interior. And when you ultimately die and meet him face to face, you know, you're going to be held accountable for your soul. And there's no surgery, augmentation, anything you can add to your soul other than the work that God wants to do in it right here, right now. So become useful for the kingdom. Please. Because here's what bogs us down. I want you to write this, these two words down. And let's just be honest. And I, th- I mentioned this earlier on, earlier on in my message. What if, write those two words down. What if? What if I'm not pretty enough? What if I'm not intellectual enough? What if I'm not successful enough? What if I'm not spiritual enough? What if I'm not sexy enough? What if I'm not funny enough? What if I fail? What if I suffer? What if I go without? Do you realize the what ifs always quench the work of the spirit? Always. Because we become consumed with these fears that may or may not even be accurate. And the good news is God says, change the what if, you're going to like this, to these two words, if God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if God brings joy, if God brings freedom, if God brings confidence, because here's what you're going to see in Scripture that when you turn to scripture passages like Romans 8, verse 31, where it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? It's not like, what if God deserts me? Wrong. If God is for us, right? It's the if God that says, it's a promise. If God clothe the lilies if God provides for the ravens. Do you see how many times if God appears in the scripture? Because God wants to quench the work of the lies we fill our lives with. If God is for us, who can be against us? When you sense God moving in radical ways in your life, you need to continue to ask yourself, what phrase is winning out in my heart? Is it what if or is it if God? Because I tell you what, I don't want to be debilitated i don't want to be useless i don't want to be quenching what god wants me to do because i grew up in a family what if you break your bones and what if you get into an accident what if this and what if that well what my mom didn't know in her short-lived life is that she would somehow create a god-honoring monster that would go out and say, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to take a risk for the kingdom. I'm going to take a risk of, of being who I am. I'm going to take a risk in telling people the truth and sharing with them the gospel. And If I would have been like, well, what if they laugh? And what if they sneer? And what if they ridicule? And what if they come back? And, and for me, I go, you know what? I can't live in this worry-bound, stifling thing that I, it's called life. I've got to be freed up to live life as if today was the end and I'm ultimately going to be accountable to God and he's going to say, why did you get bogged down with all the what ifs? Did you miss out on who I was? That's what he's going to say to me. Do you know I'm a God who's for you and not against you? 
Okay. Shift gears. How many points do we have left? Three? Okay, here we go. Now Jesus is going to turn from the negative to positive. He shifts the thinking, and he wants to give us some things to think about that are going to actually be a little bit more proactive. Check this out. Worry leads to godlessness in our lives. What do I mean by that? And, he and here's the heart of the issue. When you worry, you're no different than someone who's a non-believer. When you're worried, you, you might as well just be a non-Christian. When you worry, you might as well just be pagan, secular, whatever word you want to use, right? Worry is what people do who don't have God. And yet, when worry shows up in the believer's life, Jesus says, this should not be. See, worry projects the worst. I just got off the phone this so I was I don't know how, how many of you are having your holiday plans interrupted, altered. I mean, Thanksgiving, a lot of us said it's not going to be like Thanksgivings of, of, of years past. I just got the phone with someone this week talking about Christmas time. And they're choosing not to be with, with family. And I was talking to the, the husband, and I was like, like, what's going into that thinking? And here's, here's what he said. My wife wakes up every day. And the first thing she does is she just watches the news and she reads the news. And I'm just sitting there and I just got this cringe moment. And I'm like, number one, you allow this? Like, the, I'm, you can ask my wife. Like, she's over there, like, re and I'm like, oh, I can just tell. She's reading some, she's, you hear these, like, <laughs> I'm like, turn it off. Right? Because guess what? The, all the stuff that you want to allow into your life, it, 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 it doesn't care about your, your soul. It doesn't care about your spirit. And we just, it's like a, a flood. I'm reading this article, and I'm listening to this newscast, and I'm listening to this, and I'm listening. And we're just being bombarded with these voices. And this guy literally was saying, my wife, from the moment she wakes up, she's just filling her. And all of a sudden, you know what that does? It says, I don't want relationship. I'm going to live in this captivity of worry and fear, and so I won't see my family for Christmas. And I sit there and go, and I'm not minimizing, you know, the fact that we, we, sh we should be, you know, cautious and, and wise, but to wake up every day and allow that to be the stream that influences your life, no wonder. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I can give you five different websites right now that are these, these the, the culmination of all the news, and you read it, and you sit there and go, I read it for one minute, and my, my soul's already, like, crippled. It's like, if it's not the, if it's not the coronavirus, it's the, the sex bots that are coming after us. And if it's not them, it's, the, it's the, the wild mongooses from France that are, and the killer murder hornets. And, and ladies and gentlemen, and that's how we're living our lives. We're like, can't trust anybody, can't, can't do anything, i got to just live inside my house. And we're like... can't live like that you can't live like that you know why because none of the news you're getting today is bringing assurance to your soul write down that word assurance the news doesn't deliver assurance there's a new strain of coronavirus out there hey good job oh we don't know if the vaccine's gonna help like thanks for the assurance not ladies and gentlemen you are looking to political forces and medical experts and this and that for assurance i'm going to tell you right now it's not there it's not there the 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 non-believing world lives for this and yet they are just crippling their souls and you know what? it makes sense why because they don't have god they're looking for meaning they're looking for purpose they're looking for significance i'm going to tell you right now worry is inappropriate for us because we claim to have a heavenly father 
We claim to have some God who says, I love you and I'm going to care for you. And in my infinite power and ability, I'm going to meet your needs. And that's how we are to live our lives. And yet many of us don't live any different than those who don't have God. It's the word assurance. How are you out there not lo- walking around like this? I mean, are you walking around like, man, you know what? Yeah, I'm praying for our world and, I, and I, it sucks hearing all this news. But guess what? There's something greater to aim for. That there's a God who loves us. The connection to God is what brings about peace and trust. It's the, it's the fact that if we neglect fostering the chi- child-parent relationship, we're his kids, he's our Heavenly Father. If we neglect that, it will only fuel and perpetuate worry. Understanding God's heart and his care for us is what builds trust. And if there is no trust, that's on you. Because that is the only way you're going to counter fear and worry in your heart. And all God's people said, (laughs) you know what worry does? It feeds us with all the news of the day. But it distances us from the very feed that we need to hear every day, and that is how much our Heavenly Father loves us. Can I ask you first and foremost, this is probably the most important question, if you claim to have God as your Father because of His Son, Jesus Christ, sent for you, How daily do you first set your heart on knowing your father and what he wants for you? How many of you, instead of living in worry, are saying, I am going to cultivate a heart that says, he's my God, I'm his child, what does he want for me today? That question will combat worry in any heart that claims to love him. How many of us are living debilitated by fear and worry and we can trace it to the fact that we haven't given God even one second of opportunity to speak to us? What does God speak to us? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. You who are anxious, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. If you're anxious about anything, don't be. Well, that's easy. (laughs) But if you're to substitute. See, the problem is we sit there and go, I'm just going to tell my heart not to be anxious, not to be anxious. Oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You can say that mantra 24 hours a day. It's not going to change anything. You have to substitute it with some other activity. What's the activity? With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Christianity is not passive. Christianity is not reactionary. Christianity is all about cultivating a relationship because relationship with God will always counter fear, worry, selfishness, everything we're talking about. And what we do is we say, I'm not going to sit in this cauldron, this stew, this mire of just fear and worry and what the world, what's going on in the world. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on my relationship with God because that is eternal. And so instead of being anxious, I'm going to pray I'm going to let my request be made known to God. I'm going to be thankful, and I'm going to let that peace that God has promised transcend all understanding. It's not going to make sense to anybody outside of uh, 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 God's, God's family. The, the, the unbelieving world's not going to understand this, but I'm going to allow his peace that transcends all understanding to guard my heart. And guard literally means a sentry with a weapon that's going to stave off any enemy that's going to try to sabotage your heart. Here comes worry. <laughs> We need a video game like that. I can tell my boys, like, like, Call of Duty Jesus Ops, right? Like, there it is. Pew, pew. He will stand as a sentry, and when you cultivate a relationship with him, you let him be the fountain, the wellspring of who you are on the inside. Because without that, you will be sabotaged. That's why in verse 8, it's not up there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. 
Don't be anxious for anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving, with, su- with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Therefore, set your mind on things. Let your mindset be on the things that are pure and honorable and excellent and holy and worthwhile. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. But when it's spent on meditating on who God is and what God has done in his word, you have nothing to be concerned about. And all God's people said, Woo! two more, here we go. Worry leads to discontentment. Worry leads to discontentment. Concentration is to be on kingdom matters. Mindset, set your mind on God's kingdom. Seek first, priority, God's kingdom, and all these other things will be added unto you. Look at verse 30. One, seek his kingdom, but back up. So the, 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 the nations, right, they, they seek all the possessions, all the food, all the clothes, right? But your father, so relationship, knows what you need, so therefore seek his kingdom. And these things shall be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock. Only time in the New Testament that phrase appears. Isn't it cool? You're part of God's little flock, which means you're a sheep, he's the shepherd, which means he's smart, you're not. Let's just be honest. We end up upside down, bloated, flies infesting our nose, wandering off, not following the, the, the word and will of the shepherd. And what does the shepherd do? Leaves the 99 and goes and gets the one. How many of you have been the one before? Amen. We're in good company with each other. Oh, you of little flock, look at this. Do you not understand that the Father has found great pleasure to give you the kingdom? No Christian can ever say, God hasn't done anything for me. You know where discontentment comes from? From the heart that says, God hasn't done anything for me. Discontentment comes from the place where it's like, God has withheld. He doesn't hear my prayer. He hasn't given me what I wanted. He hasn't given me what I requested. Here's the problem. We continue to try to find satisfaction in lesser joy. May I speak about a guy named Dr. C.S. Lewis? Who is that? Glad you asked. Here's what Lewis says. Our problem is not that we want too much. It's that we're satisfied with too little. Oh my goodness, you guys. If you have accepted the rule of God, right, he's king, it's his kingdom, we are his subjects, he's not a monarch that likes to keep his people in fear, there are monarchs out there like that, this king is not like that, don't you know that he wants to give you the kingdom? If you have accepted his rule, and you're going to live now in conformity to that rule, because you know that his rule is best, the difference then becomes what we think we need, and what we really need. See, what we need most is the kingdom of God. Full stop, period. Think about it. Our greatest need is God's kingdom. Write down that phrase, God's kingdom. When it comes to that non-believer at work that, that's worried because they're listening to all the news, you know, you could just easily say one sentence. You ready? You know what you need? God's kingdom. And they're probably going to be like, weirdo, (laughs) idiot. That is the need of every human heart. God's kingdom. The neediest people in the world are those who don't have the kingdom of God. They're enslaved to the kingdom of this world. And this kingdom of the world gives nothing that ultimately satisfies. Boy, I've learned a lot about this in my life. Started when I was young. I think I was about 11, 12 years old. Home computers started to be the hot thing. 
And uh, so this is going old school. So those of you that are, we went to this store called LaBelle's. <laughs> Who remember LaBelle's? Yeah, okay. Younger people are like, what the heck is that? It's a store. And uh, we were shopping for our first home computer, right? Probably $20,000. I don't know, whatever the cost was at that time. No. It was a Commodore VIC-20. Remember Commodore? They had like Commodore 64s, Commodore VIC-20. VIC-20 was like the economic, because my family, we didn't have a lot. But we wanted a home computer. And with the Commodore VIC-20 Vic Vic that we brought home, I bought a little book, Program Your Own Video Game. Because we were a cheap family, mom was like, I'm not spending $20 on a video game. You can code your own. And so I remember the very night we came home, un unpacked the computer, I opened the book, and it was pages and pages of coding to create your own video game. Six, seven hours. I'm plugging in symbols and letters and numbers. And, and then at the end, six, seven hours, hit return. And the video game is going to pop up and you can start playing. Boop. Return. Error. <laughs> Didn't say where. Doesn't say what line. <laughs> Another couple hours spent looking. Making sure everything was entered right. Because if you get one little thing off, it's error. You're not, you're not playing this. Can I just tell you what that set in motion in my heart? I was the most unsatisfied, angry, discontented 12-year-old, maybe in Arizona, maybe the world. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, program. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. All my dreams are going to come true. I'm going to meet babes, chicks, whatever. I don't know what's going to do, but this is going to be the end-all, be-all. And I devote so much time and sweat and energy into this thing that in the end comes up, error and I wish it was a 12 year old thing I wish it didn't happen when I was 15 and I wish it didn't happen when I was 21 and I wish it didn't happen when I was 35 and I but you know what it may not be programming a video game but it's something else I'm trying to find contentment with and no matter what if it's not God you're always going to come up with an error notification and you're going to scramble and you're going to be like what is it is it me is it you is it this is it th whatever and I'm going to tell you right now if your ultimate satisfaction is not in God it's going to come up and air every time The things of this world were never designed to satisfy. They were never designed to rid you of worry. They were never meant to bring you joy. The problem is this. It's not that we want too much. It's that we're satisfied with so little. The Father wants, it is His pleasure to give us the kingdom. I mean, think about this. There is nothing that desires God, that God desires more than to say, Greg, I want to give you the kingdom. Allie, I want to give you the kingdom. Tom, I want to give you the kingdom. And yet, we are so quick to say, that's nice, but I, I really want this. Mm. Error. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't come to a place in your life where you realize you may not get what you want, but you're always going to get what you need. You're, you're going to be a happy camper. I don't have what I want, but I got what I need. Right? The kingdom must, must influence every area of my life. The kingdom of God must influence my work, my play, my money, my relationships. Everything that I consider every single day must pass through the inverted values of God's kingdom. Why? Because his kingdom is a place where his pleasure exists. His desires for me exist. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. You guys know this. It says this, my God will supply every need, every need according to his riches and glory. 
Do you, do you believe that? See, what you don't have is before this, Paul says, I'm going to encourage you to read this this, this week, Philippians 4. Take two Philippians 4 and call me in the morning for your problem and worry. The promise is based on a premise. This is only true if you choose to live according to his kingdom's purposes. This is not, I love how this is quoted so often, so widely. God doesn't give you a blank check and say, just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. That's not how God operates. On that blank track, check, there's an address. And it says, God, kingdom of heaven. That check is only valuable so much as it is drawn from the account of what ultimately matters. It's the same thing found in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. We already read it, right? Paul says this, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him give, graciously give us all things? We just saw every need. We now we see all things. Do you believe that? You can only believe it to the extent that you're willing to live for his kingdom purposes. This is not about you. This is about him. And here's the, his reputation is on the line. You're going to go out into the world and tell people you love Jesus and that you love God. Well, guess what? Your life is going to look different or ought to look different. And when you go through the storms that, you're, you're, that we're going through, there's going to be an anchor, and that anchor is called faith. That anchor is called trust. It's rooted in God. And now you're going to have an opportunity to share the hope that's in you. You're going to give an account that my God may not give me all that I want, but I tell you what, he's given me all that I need. And, I, and I'm good with that because he wants to give me the kingdom. Are you, are you ready to live like this, you guys? You can't purchase the kingdom. He gives it to you. It is a gift. It is an act of grace. It's indication that he is our shepherd. He is our father. He is our king. He is our provider. He is our delight. And so Jesus says, let me just stop and give you one practical thing to do. Look at verse 33. Here's your homework. You ready? Go sell all the stuff you've been busy trying to hoard and buy. Here's the antidote. Here is how you fight worry and fear. Go sell your possessions and give it to those who need it. But what if? No. We've already talked about this. Jesus' principle is to take the very thing you're disposed to worry about and give it away. It's the surest way to break its control over your heart. The very thing that you thought, I'm going to give it away. Boy, the, back in the day, there were things that I was like, I will not share this. And if I did, I like a book. Like I, If you've ever been to my house, you, you think like hoarders. Remember I talked about hoarders last week. Are they, did they need to do an intervention with Pastor Scott. I have a stamp called From the Library of Scott Morgan. <laughs> I'm going to stamp that book. And if you borrow that book, guess what? But there's no other way to track it. You don't know how many books I've lost, even with the stamp on it. And I pray for those people that every time they pick up that book, they see that, oh, I should give this back to Pastor Scott. <laughs> but you know what I've learned over the years? In the end, it doesn't mean anything. You could take this book. You could take that book. You could take whatever. If you need it, you can have it. And that's why things are no longer on loan. You know what you do? You give it as if you're not going to get it back. How's that? How can we practice this? this? Not only this holiday season, which tends to be a, a season of, ge of generosity, but how can we practice this in the 2021? How can maybe once a week we focus on something that we sit there and go, this is of incredible value to me, but you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm going to give it to somebody. I'm going to give it to somebody. Sell your possessions, verse 33, and give to charity. Make for yourselves purses which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where neither thief nor comes near nor, nor moth destroys. Jesus says you need to be freed up to focus on the things that worry can't destroy. Thieves can't break in. Moth can't eat. Rust can't take away. You know who's a great example of this? Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19. So we're in Luke 12, Luke, so we'll be there in three years to talk about Zacchaeus, but I'll give you a little preview right now. Zacchaeus was the money hoarding, money lo loving tax collector. 
who would charge an exorbitant fee on his services, and he built his own neighbors out of money. And Jesus sees him, and you know, remember where Zacchaeus was when Jesus came? He was up in the tree. Because that's where people who are greedy and selfish, they live in trees, right? <laughs> ah! Zacchaeus, I see you up there. Get down here. Salvation comes to the house of Zacchaeus. And the number one evidence of this man's changed life, he gives all his wealth away. Isn't that amazing? Like, you don't know how much the kingdom of God has impacted your life, but here's the barometer. How generous are you even with the things that are of value to you? Because the kingdom is more valuable. Is that the most valuable thing in your heart? Jesus wants it to be. Oh, you little flock, don't you know it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom? And you're sitting there hoarding on your cars and your homes and your hobbies and your luxuries. Become like Zacchaeus, who set his life in motion to give it all away. Because here's the question. Either you can choose to do it, or when you die, it's going to be done for you. But here's, either way, it's going to be given to somebody else. Because <laughs> you can't take it with you. That sucks, doesn't it? But it's so important. Last point, worry leads to disappointment. Seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and all this shall be given to you. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. I don't want, the reason we, th we talk about this is I don't want you to be disappointed. Every day I meet people who are disappointed because what their treasure was was not in line with what God's pleasure is. And I'm going to say that again a different way. God's pleasures are always the most important treasures. You know what you need? You need God's kingdom. You, you need God's kingdom because nothing else matters. There's going to come a day we're all going to stand before him and realize that there's one kingdom that will last forever. And I'm praying you treasure that. I'm praying I treasure that. I don't want you to be disappointed. God is not a God who disappoints. But he is a God who makes all of the things that we deeply long and yearn for come true. Things that possessions can't do. Things that hoarding can't do. Things that greed can't do. Things that worry can't change. And all God's people said, that's a hard amen, you guys. I, I know this. It's a hard amen. It's a hard message. Thank you for letting me keep you, keep you long. Keep you over time. I'm not going to make up for it next week. It'll, it'll be long next week, too. <laughs> let's stand. Let's pray. Father. <laughs> as difficult as it is to hear the words of Jesus, somehow I know that there's many of us in this room where it, it resonates. It speaks. It says something that is, it's really different. The whole idea that your kingdom principles are far different than this world's principles, it's, it's evidence. And yet, as our hearts resonate with what your son has shared with us today through Luke 12, I'm praying that not only do we receive it, but that we act on it. That somehow your word would be like seeds in our hearts to change, not just our hearts, but our behavior, our outlook, our approach. And as we become greater lovers of your kingdom, may we share that with people. Because there's a lot of people who are empty, and there's a lot of people who are disappointed, and there's a lot of people who are just dissatisfied. 
And the hope is not in princes and kings and governors and presidents and vaccines and viruses and and news and, and stimulus checks. The ultimate answer is in Christ, who is the embodiment of the kingdom, who has brought bread that will satisfy the hungriest of souls. Help us to live in Him and help us to share Him with others. Lord, thank You for not leaving us high and dry. Thank You for not leaving us desperate, hungry beggars. But You have now appointed us sons and daughters because it was Your pleasure to give us the kingdom. Thank you for being our king. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being our provider. Thank you for being our father. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.